So today, um, you may not remember a single thing that I preach, and you may never have remembered a single thing that I've ever preached. Um, maybe when you listen to sermons, you don't get anything out of them. But let me give you something that if you get nothing out of the sermon today, you can remember. So when you go home and read the scriptures, you can get something out of it. So it's three words I need you to memorize. Curious coming crisis. Um, I'll explain those three words in a minute, but um, the section that we're in in Mark is Mark chapter 12. Jesus sat down in the temple. He's cleansed it. He's already talked about this fig tree, which I don't think I explained well last week, so I'm going to go back and re-explain that fig tree. But he's sitting down in the temple, and he's teaching parables. And that's what you have to remember when you remember the three words, uh, curious, coming, crisis. So the parables are not little moral stories that teach us how we should live. Jesus told those parables in the context of his coming kingdom, of the crisis that resulted from him presenting himself as the king of Israel, and the expectation that he had that they would make a decision in that moment. So the gospel writers have recorded these parables for us, not so that we could extract some moral lesson on how we should live, whether or not we should be a good Samaritan, or whether or not we should be like the widow who gives her two coins, or whether or not we should be like what soil. What, what Jesus is telling in all of his parables is and it's an explanation of what he was doing right in that moment. And right in this moment, in Mark chapter 12, he is provoking everyone to make a decision. And that decision is, accept me as king or reject me. Does that make sense now? When you read your Bible and you come across a parable, what your first response is, is not like, how can I moralize this or extract some little principle out of it by which I must live by, but to look at the context of what Jesus was doing right in that moment. And then he tears a parable right to the people who are in front of him so that they would make a decision. And the easiest one is the prodigal son. He was talking to the Pharisees about not receiving people who were sinners who had repented and come to uh, uh, his kingdom by, by grace through faith. And the Pharisees didn't want to welcome them back. So he tells a story about a hundred sheep, ten coins, and two sons. Write to them in their face to say, you're the older son who is not receiving back the younger son, and the younger son is the welcomed one, and the older son is out of the party. He was telling that to them right now. And so what that's supposed to do is cause us to think about when people repent and come to faith in Christ, are we welcoming of them? Because I think we all understand when we've blown it and Jesus welcomes us back. We like that part of the story, but there could be a part of the people who are around us that we think, well, they should be punished even just a little bit. We shouldn't just let the son come home and, and give him the ring and the robe and welcome him back and kill a fatted calf and have a party. He's a sinner. Why should we celebrate that? Well, we're not celebrating his sin. We're celebrating the restoration of relationship, which is what the whole Bible is about. The whole Bible is about God recovering the relationship that was lost in the garden. And so when that happens, whether it happens for religious people who are self-righteous or whether it happens for sinners who have gone their own way, it's glorious in heaven when any sinner repents and turns to God. So what Jesus is doing in Mark chapter 12 is he's provoking them to a crisis. Now, think about a crisis not as just a difficult time and that all crises are alike. The, the concept of crisis is this is a once-in-moment a one-time-in-history moment. There'll never be a crisis like this again. And the Cuban Missile Crisis was like that in our country's history. 
Um, we haven't experienced a moment before that, and we haven't experienced a moment since then that was, that was like the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so the crisis that Jesus provoked by coming into the temple was unique in history. They rejected him, and they killed him, and, and um, he then was buried and, and resurrected and then ascended into heaven. But, but that moment is lost in history. So when you're reading these parables, you have to think about what was happening in that moment, but then you have to think about, is a similar crisis in front of me right now? So let me go back to Mark chapter 11 and kind of explain this fig tree a little bit more because I don't think I did it clearly last week. I got some feedback, and thank you for the negative feedback going. That wasn't that clear. Um, so the fig tree that Jesus looked at and expected some fruit from is a symbol of Israel. Israel is symbolized by a fig tree in the Old Testament. Israel is symbolized as a vine in the Old Testament. And God planted this vine, and God planted this fig tree, and God expects fruit from it. And so when Jesus came into the temple, he's now using the fig tree as a parable, as a living parable, as it were, of what is his expectation when he comes to something that he has planted. So if, if God has planted it, and God is at the beginning of the work, he has expectation that it would be fruitful, and if he comes to it, it doesn't matter whether you feel you're in season or out of season, he expects fruit from your life. If he's planted you, if he's planted faith in you, if, if you claim to be a follower of his, Jesus could come to you at any moment and expect fruitfulness. This is not what was happening in Israel. So when he came to Israel, when he came to the temple, when he came to the very epicenter of what should have been going on in the spiritual world, and he expected fruit and there was none, he said, let no more fruit be there from you. And so what he was doing was talking about how the temple was going to be destroyed and how Israel was going to be scattered in that moment. But let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 7 and and I will read it for you, because when he enters the temple, he calls it a den of robbers, and we tend to think that the den of robbers has to do with the money that they were, that they were changing in the, in the temple. And, and it had to do with that in part, but it also had to do with something else. So let me read to you from Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. So he now tells Jeremiah, stand in the gate of the Lord's house, so that would be the temple, and proclaim there this word and say, hear the word of the Lord, all you men of Judah who enter into the gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in these desperate and deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. So what does that mean? So in the ancient world, uh, gods were viewed as dwelling in temples. Now, we know that God's presence was in the temple, but God didn't dwell in the temple. Actually, the earth was his footstool. And if you read in Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah sees the Lord, he looks up and he sees the Lord. So the, the Lord's robe, the Lord's train, what they call it, or his feet were on the earth because he rules the earth, so his feet's on the earth. And so they would look up and they would see in a sense, in the temple that the Lord is dwelling in heaven, but he's also got a presence in the earth. And so this idea that God's dwelled in temples was the idea that there is no way that God is going to let his temple be destroyed because he lives there. Now, the pagans believed that they actually controlled their gods. So in their temples, there was a bedroom, there was a throne room, and there was a dining room in the temples of of ancient idols. And in the morning, the priest would wake the idol up, they would dress the idol, and they would go sit it in the, um, in, in the dining room, and they would feed it. They would make sacrifices to it. And then they would take it after it had its breakfast, and they would sit it in its throne room. And then they would come and worship the god in its throne room. And then in the afternoon, they would give the god a nap. They would lay the god down, and then God would take a nap, and then they would get him up, and they would feed him in the, in the evening, and then they would take him back uh, to his throne room, maybe for an evening session, and or back to his bed. And so this was the cycle that they did every day with their idols. And, and you can imagine how, when you're reading Isaiah, God is mocking all of that. He's, he says, you make an idol out of a piece of wood that you cut down. You use half the wood to burn a fire for yourself and keep warm. 
and then you carve a face onto the, uh, the other piece of wood and you worship it. It doesn't, it doesn't have a, can speak. It doesn't have ears that it can hear. It doesn't have eyes that it can see. It can't smell. I'm a true and living God. And so the Lord would mock their idols. But this is what people thought about is that their gods lived in the temple. So in Jeremiah, the expectation is the Israelites had fallen back into sort of the pagan understanding of God that was around them and that there is no way that God was going to allow his temple to be destroyed. So they would say the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. So anytime the prophet came to them and said, repent, they said, why repent? We've got God over a barrel. We're living here in Judah. He dwells in Jerusalem in our temple. There's no way he can come judge us if we stay near enough to God in the building. If we come to church enough, if we do enough religious practices, there's no way God can judge us because there's no way God would ever judge people who are serving him, singing songs to him, giving money to his name. No way God would ever do that because then that would be so embarrassing in the world around if all the churches went away. Well, the destruction of the temple in the Old Testament is the equivalent to Jesus Christ being crucified naked on the cross in the new. For God to allow his temple to be destroyed and the capital city of where he wanted his name to be preached was the same sort of embarrassment that would have been experienced by Jesus Christ being crucified naked on a Roman cross. So the Old Testament is just prefiguring what's coming in the new. But here's the phrase. Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known? So he pretty much hits the Ten Commandments there. And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say we are delivered. See, what they've done is they bifurcated their lives. They've said, we can go do what we want with our life, and then come in here and stand in front of you and say, we are delivered because the promises of God are so strong that any sin that I do is irrelevant. It, the prophet's going, that, that absolutely cannot be true. Only to go on doing all these abominations, has this house, which is called by, not by, name, by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Ah, so that's the phrase that Jesus quotes in Mark chapter 11, has my house become a den of robbers? And so what Jeremiah is referring to is that in Judah, groups of uh, thieves or groups of brigands would rob people and then they would go hide in a cave to be safe. So they would come out and rob people and do wrong things and then they thought, ah, oh, there's safety in a cave. And so then they would run into a cave. And so what Jeremiah the prophet is doing in Jeremiah 7, is equating the behavior of the men of Judah who are going out in society. They look prim, they look proper, like the Pharisees. They look religious, they look honorable, they even kind of look moral, but they cheat people all the time. They have hearts of bitterness. They don't follow what God has asked them to do in society to bring about social justice and care for the poor and the weak and loving their neighbor. What they do is they pursue their own ends. And as they're pursuing their own ends, if they happen to run over you, well, sad for you. And then they go into the temple and offer a sacrifice and go, it's no big deal. It's no big deal that I've cheated my neighbor. It's no big deal that I've lied to my family. It's no big deal that I've committed adultery because I'm just going to go into the temple and it'll be fine. I'll just confess it. I'll just do enough religious stuff and I'll be okay. And Jeremiah's going, you've made the temple like a cave of robbers. And that is what Jesus quoted in the New Testament is that they had, because the fig tree had this image of producing fruit, but it never did, that the whole system in Israel had fallen into this external, good-looking promise of fruit, promise of life place, and everybody walked away without ever being changed or ever being made new. 
And so that is the background of Mark chapter 11 leading into these parables. And I told you, if you memorized curious coming crisis, you would understand now the words of Jesus because he tells them a parable. So everything in chapter 12 is a parable. And everything in the parable is trying to get you, and the reason it's curious is because all the values are going to be flipped. The reason it's curious is because you're going to read the parable and you're going to go, I think I'm supposed to be that person, but I'm really supposed to be that person. Like, there was a Pharisee and a tax collector that went up to the temple to pray. Now, as the beginning of this story is, it's like, who do I get a pick to be? At the outset of this story, I think I want to be the Pharisee. The Pharisees are the good guys. The Pharisees are the ones that you want next door to you because they mow their grass and they pay their taxes. I don't want a tax collector living next to me. I mean, he's a betrayer. He's a, he's a cheater of our nation. But at the end of the parable, Jesus asked the question, who went away justified? And it's curious because the values just got flipped because everybody goes, oh, I should be like the tax collector. Or you hear the story of the good Samaritan. Right when you hear the word Samaritan, that's the enemy. And then you hear the parable and you're like, oh, I'm supposed to be the enemy. So what God is doing through Jesus' teaching here is he's, he's kind of getting below our prejudices and he's, he's kind of getting below the way we see the world and he's going, the way you see the world may, may not be right. You might be pulling your norms and your standards in the sense of your conscience from the flesh and not the spirit. So he tells the story. He says, hey, there was a, there was a landowner, and he, and he planted a vineyard, and, and, and then he put some guys in charge of it, some tenant farmers in charge of it, and then he left, and then he wanted to get fruit from it. So he sent some folks back, and, and they ignored him, and then they beat him up, and they killed some of them, and he kept sending more, and they ignored them, and, and then they killed some more of them, and, and they never churned. And then one day he goes, I know, they'll respect my son." Curious coming crisis, because when the sun comes, payment is due. When the sun comes, this is a word. When the sun comes, we've now brought it to a head, because I've sent prophets, I've sent servants, and, and you shouldn't have treated them that way, but when I send my son, you had better make the right decision. So what do they say? ah, if we kill this guy, the inheritance is ours. If we kill the son, then we'll own everything. So when Jesus tells this parable, who do you think he's talking about? He's talking about himself. He's saying, I am the son of God, the owner of the vineyard who has now come to see if you got any fruit. And they kill the son in the parable. And he goes, what do you think the father is going to do to those guys? Now, it's a rhetorical question. He's standing in the temple. Now, everybody's going to raise their hand and go, of course he's going to kill all those tenant farmers. Of course he's going to bring judgment on them. And then he quotes, curiously, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Okay. Okay. This is a quote from Psalm 118. Earlier in Mark chapter 11, we had a quote from Psalm 118. You know what that quote was? Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's Psalm 118. So the crowd was saying, save us now, save us now, save us now. And Jesus quotes the same psalm back to them. You have to go home and read Psalm 118 to understand Mark 11 and 12 and everything going on in the temple because he quotes it back to him going, no, you're going to kill the cornerstone. You're going to reject the very thing that's the fundamental foundation of all things, God. And that is Jesus himself. Jesus is the cornerstone. Now, some people say this is a capstone. Some say it's a cornerstone. So you can look up here and get the illustration. Is Jesus the alpha or the omega? And the answer is yes. He is the alpha. And he is the omega. So is he the cornerstone or the capstone? And the answer is yes. He's the foundation of all things, and he's the head of all things. 
So Jesus is everything. And he quotes the psalm back to them saying, I'm the stone that you guys are rejecting. And remember earlier in the passage, he said you could cast this mountain into a sea and I would do it for you. He's claiming to be the God of the mountain. He's claiming to be the source of all things of Daniel chapter 2. The fact that they knew, read the text, they knew he was speaking about them, they're the killers, means that they knew that he was claiming to be the son, right? They walked out going, he's talking about us, but they were afraid to grab him because of the crowd. So what did they do? We got to turn the crowd against Jesus. Hey, Jesus, um, taxes. Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? So he embarrasses them. He exposes them. And so then they think, ah, I know what we're going to do is we're going to get him to lose his popularity because if he says pay taxes to Caesar, he's going to lose the crowd. I mean, this would be exactly like me going to Philadelphia with a trench coat on and going into the end zone of a Philadelphia Eagles game, wearing a Dallas Cowboys shirt. And right when the Cowboys scored a winning touchdown to beat your beloved Eagles, I threw the trench coat off and said, go Cowboys. It wouldn't matter if y'all went to church with me. You would join the crowd and kill me too, right? You would. You would go, it's just an unpardonable sin. Even though the crowd has loved Jesus, they hate the Romans more than they love Jesus. So the, 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 they don't want to serve Jesus. They want to operate out of their hatred. And the Herodians and the Sadducees knew that. But if he says, give it to God, then the Romans are going to kill him. He got you over a barrel. So Jesus goes, hey, give me a coin. And so a Pharisee reaches into his pocket and pulls out a coin. Now, here's the hypocrisy of it all. The Pharisees didn't like Roman coins because they had little idols on them. The face of the emperor was an idol. They viewed the face of an emperor on a coin as an idol. So if a Pharisee had a coin in his pocket that had an emperor's face on it, he just exposed himself because they preached one theology, but they lived for money. So the joke of this whole story is that he even had the coin in his pocket at all. They should have said, where's a, where's a Gentile? Maybe a Gentile has a coin, but not any of us Pharisees. So he reaches in his pocket, pulls it out. Okay, Jesus is about to say something, and man, are we going to have him. And he, he's got the coin, and he goes, whose face is on it? And they go, Caesar's. It's just one word in the Greek text. And then there's a pause, and everybody's sitting around looking at one another going, uh-oh. <laughs> We've just been exposed again. Now, what Jesus is not talking about here is submitting to the government and paying your taxes. What he's talking about is what idols do you have in your heart? Like if I called in a moment and said, show me, and you went, oh, because you've been serving your idol for so long that you don't even know it's an idol. It, you think it's okay to do this. And then all of a sudden you're standing there and going, oh my gosh, in the face of the son of God, this thing is wrong. And he goes, tell me whose face is on it. Well, it's Caesar's. Well, then give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and the things that are God, that are God. And the Greek word that he uses here is icon, which is, translates salem in the Old Testament, which means image. Oh, do you remember what you were made in? You're made in the image of God. God breathed into a body the breath of life, and he stood it up in the garden as his image. So what Jesus is saying is, is you've been created for God. You've been created by God. You've been created by God to be fruitful for his kingdom. And, and think about the worth that Jesus is putting on humanity at this point. He's going, quit playing in the dirt. Quit scrambling in things that don't matter. 
I'm here to create a crisis of decision in your moment so that you cast away these idols and serve me. In this moment, could not the Pharisees have repented? You think Jesus was there to slap them down? No, what he was doing is he was coming at them hard and he was coming at them strong, but he was seeking to recover their lives. He loved them too, right? He desired the Pharisees who were about to kill him to be born again, to repent, and to know the glories of the kingdom of heaven. He's standing there in the temple taking all their grief so he can explain to them, you need to make a decision. But they're owning their money. They're owning their religion. They're owning the things that they've been taught their whole lives because, you know, when it comes to it, the majority is right. Like if everybody around me is saying the same thing I'm in and I'm in an echo chamber, I must be right. Until the Son of God stands in the center of it and flips everything. That's why all these parables are curious. So then they go, oh, you want to go with God's word, image of God, Genesis 1 and 2. Let's talk about Torah. Let's talk about now, uh, tell us, teacher, if a guy gets married and he dies, and then his wife has to marry the younger son, and then that guy dies, and then that guy dies, and then that guy dies. Who in the resurrection is she married to? Do you understand what they're doing? They're saying the, the Torah is irrelevant. Have you ever gotten in a discussion with somebody about the Bible who, like, finds some remote, isolated verse and then wants to argue with you about it? What they're saying is the word of God is not calling us to love each other and to serve our God. They're saying the word of God is irrelevant. And I have found some little piece in the Bible that I want to argue about, and it's stupid. So let's explain leveret marriage. Because land ownership was so critical in Israel, because the giving of the land was a gift, and that that land had to pass down through the families, if an older son married someone, and he died, his younger brother, his oldest younger brother, had to marry her if he was unmarried, not if he was married. This was to protect the woman, and it was also to pass on the name of the family. That was the requirement of leveret marriage. It hadn't been practiced in Israel for years because they had been cast out of the land, and they had been brought back to the land, and all that Stuff had gotten messed up. So it was something that they weren't even practicing in their day. So what they did was they went back into the Bible and they found some, some requirement and then they created a silly little scenario about seven sons and one woman and then they go, who she married to? Like the answer to that is going to be relevant. And Jesus just looks at him and goes, you have no clue what the scriptures are about and you have no clue what the power of God is. This is not a book of tiny little mysteries for us to, to get one over on our theological uh, enemies and argue about petty little stuff. What they were saying is, the word of God is not relevant anymore. And Jesus says, if you understood the relevancy of God's word, you would know the power of God but you don't. It, it, it's not a, a book of tricky little mysteries. It's not a hard book to read. Now, there's some stuff in here that's difficult to understand, but the basic message is incredibly clear. God made you, God loves you, and God is seeking to have a relationship with you. And Jesus is saying, I am here to make that happen because I understand that you turn away got other priorities that you think are most important, and I'm trying to flip all of that and set you right like I made you in the garden. I'm here to recover you. Now, if you have cancer, you don't want the doctor to go, oh, you're fine, here's a lollipop out of my bowl, go home. No, you want the doctor to say, what stage? What's the prognosis? Is there any kind of uh, opportunity for me to, to address this cancer? I want to know everything. And, and this is what Jesus is doing. He's saying everything so you can be set aright. So the Sadducees are trying to make the word of God irrelevant 
because Jesus is always going to rely on the world, word of God to reply to the people standing in front of him. He, he's the great predicted one, and so he's going to understand his ministry based on what God has already said. And if we kick out the first five books of the Bible, what do we have? And that's what the Sadducees were trying to do. So then somebody sat there and go, okay, well, if the word of God is so important, do you understand what's most important about it? He goes, well, how do you read it? He goes, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And the second commandment is very much like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus goes, bingo, you're not far from the kingdom. In other words, he wasn't going to let that teacher define who he was. Having the right answers about the Bible doesn't mean you're in a right relationship with God. Having the right theology about the Bible does not mean you're in a right relationship with God. So do you hear Jesus' voice? You have the right answers, but here's the question. Do you have the relationship? You have the relationship. You can sit around and talk about the right answers. I mean, you get the right answers. But what about that dynamic, flowing relationship between the creator of the universe and you? Is that real? Or can you just talk about what is real and observe it in somebody else's life? Or are you experiencing it? So Jesus doesn't let this guy get one up on him. He says, man, you're close. Because Jesus is standing right there. It's not about right answers. It's about how close are you to God. Let me tell you what happens when God comes. He heals. He restores. He gives power. He gives peace. He transforms heart. Have you experienced that? Is it, is it just what you talk about? Or is it something that you know daily? And that's why this parable is a curious coming crisis is because when Christ is preached for you, it's a moment of decision. And if, if you've been going along and you haven't experienced this in the past, don't put your fingers in your ear and go, la, 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 la. I don't want to hear that. Be willing to be dragged through the difficulty of understanding that all this thought, that this service that you've done to the that you thought was for the Lord counts for nothing. And that what really matters is the glory of his grace and his mercy and his power. And that you are restored not because of you being a good person. You're not restored because you have tried hard. You're not even restored because you have good intentions. You're restored as an act of his unparalleled, unbelievable, unstoppable love and mercy that God relentless in pursuing his creation to redeem it. And God's creation seems to be relentless in running away from him and creating systems that we think will ha make him happy when all he says is, I'm here to be with you. Do you want to be with me? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength. If, if I told you all that I loved Carla with all my heart and my mind and my strength, and it was just a concept, and you saw the way I treated her, then you would go, wait, that's just words to you. I don't ever see you be tender with her. I don't ever see you open her car door. I don't ever see you give deference to her. I don't ever see you talk about her as being a wonderful person to live with and how her skills and abilities flow into you and, and, and make you a better man. I never hear you talking about any of that stuff, but you say you love her with all your heart, your mind, and your strength. What do you even mean by that? Well, the evidence would be there was no fruit. So what Jesus is saying is, I want to see the fruit of you saying you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself, because that's what the whole text is about. And then he says, tell me, tell me, how can David say, because now he's going to go back to the scriptures, how can David say to his son, because everybody expected the Messiah to be the son of David, how can the son of David say to him, 
my Lord, and he quotes Psalm 110, which, by the way, is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. So if you haven't read Psalm 110, maybe you should go back and read it. It's the, the most important piece of theology from the Psalms that comes into the New Testament. And, and the whole thing is, is David's son is calling the king that rules over him God. So how could David's son, who's human, be God? And so Jesus is saying right there in front of them all, I am the son of David, and I happen to be Yahweh who created the universe. That's why he's quoting Psalm 110. But they can't answer the question. They don't understand because they have not spent the time knowing God's word to understand it in, in the terms of relationship. They've only understood it in the terms of theology explanation. So they're not experiencing what God gives. They're talking about what God gives. So Jesus comes up. This isn't like a trick question because they were trying to trick him. He was giving them the right interpretation. He wasn't saying this is some great, terrible mystery. He was going, man, if you just read it clearly, you need a Savior who's God. But don't you need a Savior who understands you? Don't you need a Savior who's walked in your shoes? Don't you need someone who sat where you've sat in life and gets being betrayed, who gets being ostracized, who gets being misunderstood and wounded? Has, haven't these things happened to you? So what Jesus is saying is, I'm that guy. I grew up in Nazareth. They, they made fun of my, my, my family heritage because my mom claimed to be a virgin when she conceived me. And stories went out that I was fathered by a Roman soldier. That I come from a terrible family. He understands. I, I, I'm that guy. And then he turns around and he, and he just gives one more point of clarity. He says, take care lest you exalt the Pharisees and the scribes. And here's why, beloved. If you grasp Jesus' words from Psalm 110, it makes sense. We don't make clergy better than anybody else. We don't make priests and people who serve God as better than anybody. Because if you set that system up, pretty soon they'll start thinking they're better than everybody. And then pretty soon they'll start coming to all your banquets and wanting the seat of honor. And then you'll start thinking, hey, they're not that human. So let's not treat them like they're like, they're like us, that they understand us. And, and here's why. Because if we raise them up, it goes back to the old religion, then we can keep one step away from God and not have to talk to him ourselves. But if everybody's the same, if everybody has the equal need, then God is speaking to everyone equally. That God is no respecter of faces. That God is saying, I don't care if you're David or you're Moses or you're Esther or you're Ruth or you're Stan or you're the Pope. Everyone needs to be saved by grace. Everyone needs to be saved by mercy. Everybody needs to come equally before the throne and bow down and say, God, save me. And put your faith and your trust in me. That's why he's saying, if you pay attention to them, then you will be like them. Pay attention to me, is what Jesus is saying, and you'll be like me. And then he does the number one curious coming crisis flip of all time. He watches a widow walk in, and when he watches her walk in, what does he do? What does the text say he does? He grabs his disciples. He goes, guys, come watch this. So we're all in the temple. This is one of the most fascinating stories in the world to me. And here's why. Because we're going to, Jesus is going to die in a couple of days. What would you be thinking about if you knew you are going to die in two or three days? I don't think you'd be watching a widow in the temple. I don't think you'd be a pay attention to anybody who you don't know as family or friend or even close to you. And Jesus in the temple has the wherewithal to go, oh my gosh, here's a widow. 
And she walks in and she gives money. And she gives everything that she has. And this is such an important event that he calls all of his disciples together. And he says, did you see that? Now, you remember when we were talking about the transfiguration of Jesus on the mountain? He only took three of his guys for that. He took three, Peter, James, and John, up the mountain to see the transfiguration. Apparently, that wasn't as important to him as them seeing this widow give two coins. He wants everybody to get this story. So if you're a disciple of Jesus, he wants you to sit down and go, oh my gosh, what in the world are you talking about? Now, the translation says she gave a fraction of a penny. Two lepta, which is two coins, was one sixty-fourth of a day's wage. So if you think about somebody who makes about $50,000 a year, who works 2,000 hours a year, so that's 40 hours a week times 50 weeks, now we have like $25 an hour is what an average person makes in America. And so 1 64th of about $250 is what you would make in a day is about three bucks. So she has about $3. She has enough money to get a Happy Meal. She has enough money to go down to the store and maybe buy a small sandwich and a water. And she puts that in to the thing, and Jesus goes, she gave more than everyone else. So she gave away her, like when you pray, daily bread, she gave away her daily bread to the Lord because he's, she's trusting him for everything. She's trusting him for her daily bread. So if I give everything to God, then he'll just give me my daily bread. This isn't talking about selling everything you have and going and serving Jesus. What he's talking about is this widow. So we wouldn't think of a widow as as the preeminent person of faith in the community. We would never think of a poor person as being the preeminent person of faith in the community because they had equated wealth with righteousness. We would have never thought a woman could do it because men were the top of the heap. So Jesus is reversing kind of like every category that we think about people being super important or or qualified, and he goes, did you see her? I've always wanted to know what the disciples thought, like, what? Her? What? Two coins? And then he doesn't give an explanation. He just says she gave more than the rest of everyone else and then let that bomb go off for about the next three decades in our lives going, oh my gosh, what is Jesus doing in our world? How are we just roped into all these categories that we think are important? And what if the Son of God stood in the middle of them and we said, what are you even talking about? I mean, isn't that what your spiritual life looks like? This constant encounter with God's word in your spiritual life that Jesus is always flipping stuff And you're going, oh, wow, that thing that I used to be thinking important, it's not that important anymore. Right? That attitude, that issue, whatever it was, it's not that critical anymore. Whose image? Whose image is on it? Yeah, give that back to God. That's what Jesus is saying, is you have been made in the image of God. Just give that to God, and I'll take care of, of everything. And so as we go through chapter 13 and 14 and and lead up to this, don't forget those words, curious coming crisis. Because all this teaching that Jesus is doing is to try to get the nation of Israel in that moment to finally go, we give up and we serve you. And that's what the sermons are about, right? Man, what is it that you're hanging on to? that's better than Jesus? What is it you think that can deliver you that's better than Jesus? What, what possibly could be in this world that could deliver you from life and death and the power of demonic beings or sorrow and suffering or trauma and tragedy? What possibly exists in this world that has sovereign power over all things other than Christ our Lord, who has visited us by his spirit. Father in heaven, we thank you that when Jesus brings a crisis into our moment, into our lives, he's not bringing us it to us 
to pound us down, but to deliver us from even our own bad thinking and the ills of this world. Pray now that I myself and and the rest of the beloved saints of Jacob's and everybody who is here today give real thought to what it means to have Jesus of Nazareth, the risen Son of God, stand at the very center of our thoughts and the very center of our desires and how transformative it would be to be that near the throne of grace and the author of peace. This is what we seek. This is what we desire. And may you cause it to happen through the power of your spirit. In the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. You please stand.